dear colleagues, so we will continue and uh, we will go to uh, Denmark uh, with uh, the help of uh, Professor Helle Fogg uh, from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, the title of the presentation is Defining the King's Authority, uh, Power Struggle and Compromise in 13th Century uh, Danish Politics. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I will start with a quote. In 1240, and then the quote starts, died King Valdemar II on Maundy Thursday. Most truly, when he died, the crown fell off the head of the Danes. Since he died, the inhabitants started to quarrel, a fight amongst each other, in all the neighbor countries, they became a laughing stock, and the lands that their ancestors had won with sword and victory were not only lost for the crown, but the inhabitants of the conquered lands became enemies of the realm and caused it great damage, as we daily experience. All this has the leaders themselves created by raging war upon each other because as our Lord says in the gospel, any kingdom divided against itself must fall, unquote. This was written in the Chronicle of Rul Abbey around 1288, only six years after Denmark's first constitution was issued in 1282. The author of the Chronicle was looking back at the 40 years of civil wars and struggles between kings, magnates, and bishops leading up to the constitution. During the rule of the Valdemarian kings, that is Valdemar I, Knut VI, and Valdemar II, that lasted from 1157 to 1241, the Danish realm experienced a time of internal peace. The political landscape was characterized by cooperation between the royal authority, the leading lords, and the church. It was probably also during the reign of Valdemar I that the parliamentary system was firmly established. The parliament in Old Danish Hof was an annual gathering of the most prominent, prominent men of the realm, lay as well as ecclesiasticals, known as the best men of the realm. The parliament function was to advise the king discuss new legislation, taxes, etc. Likewise, it was under the Valdemarian kings that the three legal provinces of Denmark got the first written legislation in the first part of the 13th century. And here you see the three legal provinces that the kingdom consists of. The provincial laws were written down with the content of, and probably on the initiative of, the crown, the secular elite, and the church. And the laws meant that the, that the royal administration of justice was strengthened during the first part of the 13th century. The stable domestic condition and close cooperation between the church and the crown came to an end at, after the death of Valdemar II in 1241. Subsequently, the sons and grandsons of Valdemar II Second started to fighting in their bids to succeed to the crown. Valdemar II left three legitimized sons, King Eric IV, Val Abel, who was Duke of Schleswig, and the youngest Christopher, who in the first place only got an income. When Abel became king in 1250, the civil war between him and Eric IV ended with Eric murdered, being murdered by Abel's men. But Abel, he only held the crown for two years before dying himself in battle. After the death of Abel, Christopher took the crown from under the nose of Abel's minor sons, thus paving the way for the next round of civil wars to kick off between the royal line of Christopher and Abel's descendants fighting for the dukedom of Schleswig, only ended in 1282-3 as part of the compromises leading up to the Constitutional Charter. There are many explanations to why the stability broke down in the 1240s. The most obvious one is, of course, rivalry 
for the throne, but the reason should also be found inside the realm. Many of the most powerful lord supported the dukes and the close cooperation between the royal power and the, most, uh, and the magnates, the secular as well as the classical, broke down. And in the wake of that, the king tried to weaken the power for lords by issuing royal legislation and repeal privileges. And this PowerPoint is not really showing anything. I just thought it was a nice picture for the next thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, because it, it is very difficult to get a picture of the political events leading up to the Constitutional Charter of 1282 in Denmark. That is due to the source situation. There are no narrative sources that cover the 13th century in Danish history. What we have is only a line here and there in a yearbook like King Eric led an army against Abel or the peasant on Sealand revolted. The charters, we also have charters that give a glimpse of who that was in the company of the king or the duke, but the concern of the charters are transfers of landed property, not political history. Hence, we are left with a puzzle with too few pieces and a lot of blank spaces. But what these glimpses reveal are that the peasant revolted several times, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and the Hans Attic leads used the unstable condition to raid the Danish coast and coastal towns, and that some of the members of the oldest and wealthiest magnate family was executed for high treason or went into exile. The question remains, however, why did some of the old magnate families on which the support the Valdemarian king has built their power abandon uh, his son and grandson on the Danish throne in the support of the Abel line. It can only be a qualified guess due to the sources, but it seems like Eric IV, and especially Christopher I, gradually replaced the royal advisors and instead of cho chosen persons belonging to the old families, they surrendered themselves with newcomers, often not even belonging to the Danish elite, but being from northern Germany. These newcomers owned their position and possession to the king, and hence they were his loyal men. This must, must be interpreted as the king's attempt to strengthen the royal power of behalf of the old elite. The old elite not only controlled large area of especially the eastern provinces of the kingdom, Scania and Jutland, they were exempted from taxes and had the control over the administration of justice. It was also members of, the, of these family that were bishop in the eastern very wealthy bishoprics. The old elite and the Valdemarian king had a common interest in creating a more stable and peaceful society after a long period of the dynastic struggles and anarchy in the 12th century, ending when Valdemar I became sole ruler in 1157. Both parties saw an interest in legal reform and a, reforms and a strong navy that could protect the coast. For that purpose, they were willing to give up some of their old privileges in return. However, there was a limit, and when the king started to legislate without the consent of the Hof, the gathering of the best men, the parliament, and the provincial assembly, in order to raise the taxes and introduce not only capital punishment, but confiscation of land in case of Le Maestre, which was both an unheard crime and unheard punishment in a society where the allegiance to the king could be withdrawn if he broke his promises. Capital punishment was only for thieves and confiscation of inherited land unknown. In this way, the king acquired a powerful tool not just to discipline a single magnet, but to destroy his entire family by removing from the next generation the family's economic foundation. The first attempt was made in the 1240s and again in the 1250s, but the legislation was probably not in force before 1276, due no doubt to the strong resistance against it on the part of the magnates. But it illustrates, however, 
uh, how the cohesive force in the kingdom broke down. In the same period, the bishop started to claim the independence of the church. It's not surprising. It's found all over Europe in this period, but it's hardly a coincidence that it was the most that it was the most combative bishop who sat on the richest seats in eastern Denmark, and they all belong to the rebellious family. Hence, it is difficult not to see a close connection between the struggles over which law they should submit to each other, the kings or the church, and the conflicts with the old elite. King Eric V, Christopher I's son, won a decisive legal victory over the rebellious Eastern Bishop in 1272 that resulted in that the crown gained increased power over the church's land and men. The king now held a strong position. Many members of the old elite's families had lost their power or were exiled or killed. Eric V used this position in 1276 to get the legislation about Le Majestad pushed through and have his two years old son, Eric Crown, as co-ruler by the parliament. This was, this was a practice introduced in 1170 and used as a method to try to pacify rival royal lines in case the king died before his son has established a power base that could secure his election. The sources offer scant information about the parliament of 1276. But the royal friendly sources inform that many of the lords were present and that they did homage to the infant prince, with the exception of the Lord High Constable, D. Anderson. If he was the only resisting, it's doubtful. Here, we get a glimpse of the political disagreement between the king and some of his magnet. At the same parliament, a royal ordinance of Le Maestas was presented to those attending the ordinance was subsequently abol abol ab abolished in 1282. They advanced the next six years leading up to the Parliament of July 1282 are not known. But the aforementioned chronicle of the, from the Abbey of Ruth tells of some further strife that arose between the king and the princes. Which princes this might refer to is not mentioned, but it seems likely that they included the sons of the Dukes of Schleswig and Norton Halland, who had demands of the dukedom that their father had previously held. Taking subsequent event into consideration, it is evident that the strife was not only between the king and his royal cousins. Many displeased magnates either joined the struggle or used the unstable condition as an opportunity to express their discontent with the king. One later source from the 16th century can be interpreted as proof that the Magnus stirred up the peasants against the king, probably due to the heavy increase in taxation and forced labor. All of it culminated in a longer political process started in March uh, 1282, when the king issued a provincial decree were in his power to judge, legislate, and collect taxes without the parliament's consent was significantly reduced. The decree was promulgated by the king on the, and I quote, the advice of all Danes and all Danes agreed, unquote. And in addition, the bishop and princes, um, in a, the decree mentioned that it was witnessed by and quote again, the best men of the kingdom both lays and learned, unquote. Later this year in July, the parliament assembled again in Nuburg, where King Eric V issued the charter that has been promised in March. Eric V's constitutional charter has 18 paragraphs, and to give you an idea of the length, that is about three printed pages, so it's not long at all. And it comprised of four parts. The first part gives general protection against the king's arbitrary use of power. The first provision state that a parliament should be held once a year. Most of the paragraph then concern the use of royal intervenes in the prosecution process and also revoke all laws that were in conflicts with the law of King Valdemar at, time, at the time of the charter, the laws of King Valdemar proper referred to non-royal legislation, i.e. the provincial laws, 
and the royal legislation given before the death of Valdemar II in 1241. These two uh, corpus of laws together became later known, um, became later a symbol of the good old laws. Concerning the administration of justice, it is stated that no one could be imprisoned unless he confessed of a court red-handed, nor could anyone receive a punishment other than what was stated in the laws. The second part of the charter was about the protection of the peasantry. Those provisions regulated the paying of tax and st stated a general prohibition against forced labor except in times of need. The third part of the charter was concerned with the protection of merchants. And finally, the church in Denmark should have all the freedom it had held in the time of King Valdemar II. It's quite interesting that the church came last. Normally, the protection of the church was considered the main obligation of the king. And the placement of the church is a strong indication of how much the conflict leading up to the charter was between the king and the secular lords and how weakened the Danish church was after the long struggle with the royal power. The charter not only bound Eric V, but also whoever who would succeed him as king, the charter does have the character of providing a constitutional document for the whole of the realm. Eric V had only had a short time to enjoy the stability. In November 1286, he was stabbed 56 times his killers were never found, but the same lords who forced the king to issue the constitutional charters, charter was charged and convicted by a show trial. They fled the realm, allied themselves with the king of Norway, and led a guerrilla war against, the Danish, the, against Denmark until the judgment was recalled and the heirs got the confiscated land back. Why Eric V was killed and by whom is still an open question. But if we shall believe the before mentioned uh, chronicle from Rud Abbey, then Eric, the king, committed many uh, evil deeds, unspeakable deeds. He robbed the churches, and if someone suffered injustice and complained to him, he did not do right. Other later sources mention how he raped or seduced many a noble woman. Basically, the sources agree that he was a bastard. Hence, there's no need to say that he was killed due to the constitutional charter or the legal reforms that came in the aftermath of it. Eric V's constitutional charter was by far the most important constitutional legislation in medieval Denmark, both in the long and in the short term. The constitutional charter, as shown about, weakened the royal power and put a stop to royal attempt to, uh, by the king in the second half of the 13th century to strengthen their power uh, through unlineal legislation applicable to the whole realm. The constitutional charter strengthened the power of the elite, both the lay and the ecclesiastical one, by protecting them against the king's despotic action and by giving them the final says in matters of new legislation and new tax, taxes and, and duties. Parliament and later from the early 14th century, the Council of the Realm maintained this position with a few brief exemptions right up to the rise of absolutism in 1660. The weakening of the royal power and concurrent strengthening of the power of the Magnus that does not make it sound like the legislation designed for the whole realm united the kingdom. Nevertheless, it's my claim that it was precisely what Eric V's constitutional charter did. Series about state building view constitutional legislation as an important step in the direction of turning a kingdom into a state. The power struggles in the second half of the 13th century were not so much about the contents of the laws, but more about who should have the right to the administration of justice, the kings or the courts, and whether or not the king should be bound by the law. The legal and economic systems that formed gradually during the 13th century became so well established that the administration of justice, tax, trade, and so on continued uninterrupted well into the 17th century. 
And all this despite the fact that in the 14th century, the kingdom was pawned to foreign, foreign princes and also experienced an interregnum. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>